Hi, welcome to room nine, our region's largest classroom. I'm Mrs. Williams. I teach first grade in the Windsor C1 School District. That's in Imperial, Missouri. This is Mrs. Forth. Hi, everybody. I'm from the Rockwood School District. I'm excited to be here with you today as we learn a little bit about reading and math. So before we start, we really want to know, where are you? Are you near the airport? Top Golf? Are you out at Six Flags? That's where I live. Yay! Are you near the Magic House? Closer to the zoo? Maybe you are close to the St. Louis Arch or the Mississippi River. Where I'm at, I'm a little bit south of St. Louis in Herculaneum near the Mississippi River. It looks like we have friends from all over St. Louis joining us today. Thanks for joining us, guys. Very exciting. Okay, let's go ahead and start with our welcome poem. I'm going to point to the words. Feel free to join along with me as I say I'm ready. Welcome, welcome, everyone. How are you today? We are so glad to be with you learning math and reading too. And speaking of how are you today, we need to do a zone check because before we get ready to learn each day, we check in on our body and brain. Really smart scientists that study brains know that happy, calm brains do the best learning. If you are in the green zone, that means that you are calm, you are happy, and you are ready to complete your work, help others, and reach your daily goals. And this is the hand signal. So if you are in green zone, show me you're green and good to go. If you are in the blue zone, you might be feeling a little slow and low today. You might need to draw a picture get a hug, or think some happy thoughts to be ready to learn. Your hand signal will look like this. If you are in the yellow zone, you're maybe a little frustrated, anxious, or maybe just really excited in a good way, but not ready to learn yet. So you need to take some deep breaths, get a hug, or talk to an adult that can help you be ready. If you are in the red zone, you have flipped your lid, your hand signal looks like this, and you're probably not learning with this right now, you're very angry or upset about something. You need to stop, get help from an adult, take some deep breaths, and check the size of your problem. So show me your hand signal. Are you green zone and good to go? I hope you are. If you are blue, yellow, or red, choose one of our strategies to help you get ready to learn. Are you guys ready to get started today? All right, before we start, let's do our room nine chant. Can you read this along with us? Okay. I am smart. smart. I am kind. I am brave. I am me. Hi, friends. Welcome back. Mrs. Forth here. Last week, we started talking about blends. Do you remember what blends are? Yeah, they definitely have to do with letters. Now, I hear some of you trying to say some blends. I also hear some digraphs, too. So remember, a digraph is when two letters come together to make a brand new sound. That's different than blends. A blend is when two consonants go together and they make a blended sound, which means you kind of say it so fast that it's hard to hear every part of that blend. So we really worked with some L blends. Do you remember? For example, yeah, a P by itself would say, and an L by itself would say, oh, but when I put it together, it's oh, oh, yeah. And the L is what's tricky to hear in that blend. Can I show you another blend? Okay, what about this one? I'm gonna show it and you say it. Gl, like glass, the glass. Good, what about this one? Gl, like flower. What about this one? Bull, like blend or black. Cool, clown, class, closet. That's right, it's full again, flower, flag. What about this one? Slow, slow, sleep, slither. Slippers, those are all L blends, and the L is a little bit tricky to hear sometimes in those blends. 
I have a new set of blends to teach you this week. This time, it's a consonant with the letter R. A consonant with the letter R. Do you want to see the first one? What are you thinking? How might we say that blend? Crr, like crayon, crown, crash, crumble, cry. There's another one. Frog, Friday, from. This one. Br ring. Br what else? Branch. Red. So did you notice that all of those had an R? So some blends have an L and some blends can have an R. I'm wondering if there's even more blends that we're gonna learn about together. So the big thing to keep in mind in a blend is they still make the same sound. Those letters still make the same sound, but it can be kind of tricky to hear both sounds in the word. So sometimes you wanna slow that blend down to really make sure that you hear both sounds. We're gonna keep talking about those R blends all week. The next thing that I wanna spend some time with We've really done a lot of work with nonfiction together. I love nonfiction. I love that you can read nonfiction in a certain way. But one thing we haven't talked about is how to really decide, hmm, what's the most important thing that I'm learning on this page? If you remember, we talked about when you read nonfiction, you wanna stop and think, and really think about what you learned on a page. And there's so much stuff in nonfiction books that sometimes it can be tricky to really decide what's most important here because we know there's lots of text features and photographs. There's a lot of words and new words to learn. And so today I wanna to teach you one thing that you can do to help you decide what is most important. And when we talk about what's most important, we're talking about the main idea, the main idea. So this is what I want to show you today. I want you to really pay attention and notice the bold words. We've talked about bold words before. Those are those words that pop out at you because they're really dark. Usually they're new words that the author wants us to know. So today we're really going to spend some time really paying attention to those bold words to help us decide the main idea or what's most important, right? And then also we're going to notice what repeats? To repeat is to do again and again. And if you pay attention closely, you'll notice that sometimes the authors repeat certain words over and over again. And that can be a clue of what this author thinks is most important. And that's really what we're trying to figure out. What does the author want us to know on these pages? So I think we should try this out. What do you think? All right, I have our book, Baby Chipmunks by Bobby Kalman published by Crabtree Publishing. So thank you to the publisher and the author for, yeah, allowing us to read this book. Without them, we wouldn't even have this book. So we're gonna take some time to read a couple pages in Baby Chipmunks. And I really want us to stop and think, hmm, let's notice those bold words and notice what the author, Bobby Kalman, is repeating over and over again and see if we can retell the main idea or what's most important about the pages in that book, okay? All right, so let's go ahead and start with, we'll go ahead and just do the very beginning of the book, okay? Baby chipmunks. So just like before, let's take a second and do what nonfiction readers do, and let's study the whole page. Go ahead and check out the whole page. What are you noticing? Yeah, I notice a heading. Hmm? Yeah, I'm noticing a photograph. There's some here. Look at those little baby chipmunks. That's right, there is a caption. There's a caption to match that photograph to give us more information. And some bold words too. I'm seeing some here. And 
up there too, right? Okay, so are you ready? We're going to read together. And as we read, I want you to notice the bold words and notice what repeats. So if you notice a bold word, go ahead and shout it out at me and I'm gonna write it down on another sticky note. And if you notice that the author keeps saying the same thing over and over again, guess what I want you to do? Yeah, say, Mrs. Ford, stop. I'm noticing what repeats. Hey, are you ready? Let me get my sticky note. Here we go. Baby chipmunks. Baby chipmunks. A chipmunk is a mammal. Mammals, I heard you. Okay, I'm gonna write the word mammal down because this is a bold word. And remember, we're noticing bold words, noticing what repeats. Mammals have hair or fur on their bodies. A chipmunk has fur covering its body. Mammal babies are born. They come out of their mother's bodies. Oh, well, that's right, there is another bold word. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and write born. Okay. Yeah, you know what? I'm hearing the word mammal over and over again too. That's really good thinking. It's here and here and here, but I already have mammal written down, so I'm not gonna write it again. We just know this word must be really important to what we're reading about right now. Okay, mammal babies are born. They come out of their mother's bodies. Baby chipmunks are called kits, pups, cubs, or just baby chipmunks. So I'm going to write kids, pups, cubs. Okay, anything else? Okay. Yes, I'm seeing the word chipmunk a lot. I see it here and here and here and here and here. That's probably a word I'm going to want to write down. So I'm going to go ahead and write chipmunks. So on this page, what do you think we could say is really important or the main idea? What did the author want us to know on this page? We saw the word mammal a lot and chipmunks a lot, born, kids, pups, cubs. What do you think? Chipmunks are mammals because they are born. That sounds good. Any other ideas? Baby chipmunks or kids, pups, and cubs are born. They are mammals. Yeah, I would agree with you that Bobby Kalman wanted us to know that baby chipmunks are born and therefore they are mammals. I think that's a great idea of what we learned on that page. You want to try the next page? Okay, I'll keep my sticky note available too. Here we go. All right. Baby chipmunks are born in litters of two to eight babies. So now we're adding litters. A litter, there it is again, is two or more babies born at the same time. Wow, there's the word born again too. The babies are born without fur. They are blind and tiny. Their ears are closed. They cannot see or hear until they are about one month old. So we heard the word litters a lot, and it's a bold word. We kept hearing the word born, 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 which we have here. So now what are you thinking? Now that I've read both of these pages, what would you say this whole part is about? The whole part of baby chipmunks. Yeah, think about it for a second. Let's use what we what we heard. Lots of these words were bold and repeated over and over again. Did we hear mammal a lot? Mm -hmm. Born? Chipmunks? What about kids, pups, and cubs? Yeah, they were bold words, but they weren't repeated a lot. So I'm wondering if she just wanted us to know what those meant. So, but litters, that was bold, and we saw it more than one time. So let's see, hmm. Baby chipmunks 
are mammals that are born in litters. Is that what this is about? Baby chipmunks are mammals that are born in litters. I think, I think that's what I can say that this whole part is about. I think I'm gonna write that down on this new sticky note. Baby, help me out, baby chipmunks are born in litters. They are mammals. Wow, look at that. You read all of that on those two pages and you were able to quickly figure out what was Bobby Kalman really wanting me to know on these pages? What is most important? You figured out the main idea and you did that because you noticed bold words as we were reading and you noticed what repeats. What words was the author using over and over again? Great job. So what I want you to do today and every day when you're reading nonfiction, I want you to try that out. When you get done with those two pages and you stop and think, I want you to think, hmm, what were those bold words? And why did the author repeat over and over and over again? Okay, time for you to go off and see Mrs. Williams. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Thanks, Mrs. Forth. Hey guys, it's time for us to get growing our math brain. Now, normally we do a little bit of skip counting, we're counting by ones, um, but today we're gonna do a bigger number battle. So we're gonna be comparing some numbers that I need you to use your clues and your super smarts to decide which number is greater. So here are the first two contestants in the bigger number battle. Taking a look, taking a look, taking a look, look, look. Now the first thing we're gonna do is read both numbers. 70 and 21. And then we are going to use our super sleuth powers to check the 10 spot and see which has more in the tens. Which one has more groups of 10? Is seven tens or two tens greater or more? Hmm. If you said seven tens is more and 70 is the winner of the bigger number battle, you are correct. Let's go ahead and try another pair. Taking a look, taking a look, taking a look, look, look. Did you check your 10 spot? Who's the winner of the bigger number battle? If you said nine tens was more than four tens, that 94 is, or 93 is the greater number, you are correct. 93 is the winner of the greater number battle. All right, here is our next pair of contestants. Who will be the winner of the bigger number battle? Check your 10 spot. Oh, 52 is greater than 17. Congratulations, 52. You are the winner, winner, chicken dinner. And for our next pair, who will be the winner of the bigger number battle? Did you say 65? Yeah. Six tens and five ones is definitely more than three tens and eight ones. And our last pair is a doozy. If you are seeing double, then you are correct. 16 and 16. What do we do, guys? There are the same number of tens and the same number of ones. Do you remember the word that we use to describe this number battle? They're equal or the same. Good job, guys. All right, well, now that we've got our brains warmed up, we're gonna get started on our lesson for today. Your job is to be able to say, I can add and subtract within 100. 
Yeah, guys, we are growing our brains with some bigger numbers. So last week, we learned all about adding two-digit numbers. So this week, we're going to do a little bit of practice with subtracting two-digit numbers. Now, we're not just going to throw that addition out the door, so have your brain ready for both. Today, we're going to use our tens and ones um, to help us out, and I've got a new model for you. Um, this is a ones block looks like this, kind of like the same thing as our ones discs, right? We've used these guys before. Now, if we make a group of 10 of these guys, we get to trade for a base 10. Do you know why it's called a base 10? Let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. There are 10 here. So this is what we trade for if we get a group of 10 ones. Now you might be saying, that's pretty cool, Mrs. Williams, but what about if we get 10 groups of 10? Dun, 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 dun. We get to trade for a hundreds block. Do you know why? Each of these is 10. We know that, right? It's the same thing as this. But if we count by 10, 10 times, do it with me. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. So this block represents our group of 100. So this is what we'll be using today as our visual model to help us out. We'll also still be writing the number sentence. So we have our ones house, our tens house, and our hundreds house. And we know that when we're adding, sometimes our ones house gets too full. And we have, to, we have a group of 10 and it gets to move over to the tens house. And that if the tens house gets too full and has 10 tens, it gets to trade up for a hundreds block sweet, and move on over to the hundreds house. But when we're taking away, sometimes we have to trade down. Watch what I mean. Let's go ahead and um, roll ourselves a number. Let's just say that we're starting with three tens. I'm gonna use this to represent our tens. I'm gonna draw a long rectangle to represent tens, just like our base 10 block. So we have three tens and two ones. So I'm going to draw little cubes just like these guys for my ones. Now we're going to try and make sure that when we draw these, we organize them into groups of five if we can, because that makes it easier for us to count on, right? We know that um, counting on by fives and tens is faster than counting by ones. Let's see what our, what the number is that we're taking away. So we started with 32 and we're taking away 110. And how many ones? Six ones. So this is what our number sentence would look like. Oh, Mrs. Williams has an adding brain on today. We need our minus mustache or our takeaway, our subtraction sign for this one. Now, if I'm going to take away, I'm going to start here in the one spot and I'm taking away six. Do I have six ones to take away? Gosh, I don't. But I know that sharing is caring and my friend over here in the tens house will let me borrow a group of 10. Because if I have a group of 10, I think I'll have enough to give six away, right? 10 is greater than six. So I say, hey guys, I need to give away six ones, but I don't have enough. Can I borrow back a group of 10? And the tens group says, okay, now we only have two, but that's cool. We want to help you out. So let's show our 10 ones here in our 10 spot or in our one spot one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Gosh, I'm sure glad that our friends in the tens house let us borrow a ten because now we have enough to give away six. So let's go ahead and take away that six, those six ones 
One, two, three, four, five, six. And we also need to take away 110. So now taking a look, how many ones do we have left? Since we organized those in groups of five, I can say five, six, and 110. Or we can do it this way with our number sentence. He says, uh-oh, there's more on the floor. Six is greater, six ones is greater than two ones. I have to borrow a 10. I come on over here and say, can I please borrow a 10? I don't have enough to give away six ones. And the 10 spot says, okay, I used to be a three, but now I have two tens. Now I can put that 110 on over here and 110 and two ones is 12. So 12 ones minus six ones is how many? Let's put 12 in your head and count back six. So 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. And two tens minus one ten gives us one ten. Do they match? Yes. Both strategies work. So I hope now that you have feel like you've grown your brain and know how to take away using our place value in tens and ones. And tomorrow we're gonna go ahead and get practicing. I hope that you have a great day. Make sure that you take your room nine rules with you. Rule number one is be safe. Make your space bubble and stay inside of it. Rule number two is be responsible. That means that you're taking care of yourself, your work, and your chores. Rule number three is be respectful. Treat other people the way you would want to be treated. And rule number four, make yourself proud. I hope that you make yourself proud today, and I can't wait to learn with you again soon. Bye. Teaching in Room 9 is made possible with support of Bank of America, Dana Brown Charitable Trust, Emerson, and viewers like you.